from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son. It's burning in 
Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Children's Church, you may be dismissed at this time. You guys may be seated as we go to a time of prayer this morning. <laughs> That's probably one of my favorite parts, right? Just I could just watch. <clears throat> they're excited to go, and uh, I don't know if they're glad to get out of here or just excited to be there, you know. But it's good 
to see kids excited to go hear about God. And uh, I, I, I'm so thankful for all of our teachers and all of those that do a wonderful job there. Don't you love the, the part of that song that says, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Fear can be a crippling thing in your life. And when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can lean on him and give him those cares and those fears and those things. And it's such a wonderful thought that he, he can do some amazing things in our lives if we just turn to him and allow him to do that. You know, this morning as we uh, <clears throat> let the band here play for just a minute, I thought <clears throat> maybe it'd be a great opportunity for us to just, maybe you didn't have this opportunity all week, but I'd like you to just pause and bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute and just think about what you're thankful for. see this morning in, in those moments, I hope that your heart has turned towards the Lord and you re, you've been reminded of all that he has done. He sent his son. We get ready to celebrate this season that Jesus Christ came to make our relationship right with the Lord. And if my prayer for you this morning is that you found that to be the top of your thankful list everything that Jesus Christ provided for you. What an amazing, amazing heart and thankfulness I have in that. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Father, I'm so very thankful for the opportunity we have to turn towards you. Lord, as we have sung and worshiped you, I pray that it was just a wonderful sound before you this morning. As we've lifted our praise towards you, Lord, I just continue to, to stand in your word that says that where two or three are gathered, you're with us. You inhabit the praise of your people. Lord, I am very thankful for that thought. I pray that this morning the, the word of God would just continue to touch our hearts and our lives. And I pray for Pastor Greg as he has prepared all week and done uh, <clears throat> his study and just continue, Lord, uh, to use him as you give him the words to say. Thank you for all that uh, he has done and prepared. Lord, your word is powerful and quick. We just look forward to hearing what you have to say. Lord, I thank you for all the groups that have been meeting over the course of these last few weeks. And I just am thankful for all the participation and the different ones. God, you, you, you just use these opportunities as we study your word to just continually to mold and shape us Help us to be more like you, to be conscious of what you're doing in this world around us, and, and to be a, a witness to who you are and what you can do, the hope that you have to provide. Lord, I thank you for your provision. You've continued to show yourself faithful. You have an amazing group of people at Providence Church, and they continue, Lord, to give back to you what's already yours. Lord, whatever that may look like in each family's life, I pray that, that we just continue to trust you and we, we give to you what's already yours. And then once again, Lord, I just uh, am so very thankful to see your hands in what we are doing. Lord, we continue to ask that as we give and help uh, with like Matthew Project or the Adopt the Families, and we saw so many families come through the food bank and pick up food and different things. Lord, I pray that we will continue to be your hands and feet, continue to work and, and do the th things that you are calling us to do. God, we love you. Love these kids who are going to get gifts. Lord, we pray over those gifts and they just ask that, that they would understand who and, and what you can do in, your, in, in their life. But God, we know that you are good. Your love is amazing. Your grace is truly uh, amazing your faithfulness we continue to lean towards that help us during this season lord just to continue to hear your voice to feel the, the nudge as we need to speak into life speak life into other people's hearts and, and, and the things that they have going on 
We love you so very much, Lord. Help us to be that conduit. We're going to give you honor and praise this morning. Will you join me in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples? Our Father, who art in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven, and give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Good morning. Good things are happening. Watching some of you come in. I think there's some of you who have not met yet. My name is Greg. My joy to uh, be the pastor here at Providence. And as we've seen a lot more folks coming in, especially this season, if you're not on our text list, make sure you do that. It's real easy. Take your phone and you're going to type the word Providence and you're going to send it to 94,000. Providence 94,000. That'll subscribe you to our text list. We send eh, one to two updates a week. That way you know everything that's happening, especially during this Advent season. And you can be up to date with all that's going on. Now, speaking of Advent season, I'm excited this Tuesday morning, we start our anticipation class. Tuesday morning, six, uh, 9.30, is it 9.30, Jeff? Is it 9.30? 9.30, and then 6.30 at night, same class, teaching it twice. Um, a lot of you have been signing up. I do want to remind you that if you come to my class, you do have to behave yourself. And um, after seeing some of the names on the list, I'm a little concerned. I will send you to Jeff's office, okay? So, so just be aware. But hey, it's not too late to jump in. Man, we're going to take some notes. We're going to have some Christmas treats out, play some Christmas music. We're going to walk through some scripture for the four weeks. I'm really pumped and excited about that. And uh, speaking of Christmas treats, of course, next week, come early, go to that back patio area because we're going to have a lot of Christmas treats laid out. All right, fantastic. If you have your copy of the scripture for the last time in this series, let's go to the book of Colossians as we finish up. Finally, we're going to week number 11 of our Colossians series. And this one, this final one, it just threw me a curveball the last two weeks in such a good way, and I can't wait to share it with you. In fact, such a curveball that we're only going to study one scripture this morning. Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. Colossians 4, verse 17. Or rather, it's one sentence, or it's a whole chapter. It's still God's word, right? That means it's inerrant. It means it's inspired. It means it's infallible. It means it speaks to all those chambers of our lives. And so we read the short and the long with just as much reverence every time. Colossians 4, verse 17. And say to Arpachus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. All right, let's pray. Father God, as we come before you this morning, um, for this last time in this amazing book, Colossians, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would take these words, they would lift them off the page. Lord, your Holy Spirit would open our eyes, it would open our hearts, that God, you would apply these truths to our life in such a special way, Lord, and we leave here, we leave and we live like they truly matter. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Usain Bolt is widely considered the greatest sprinter of all time. A Jamaican athlete who most notably won the gold medal in the 100 meter and the 200 meter run for three Olympics in a row. Think about how remarkable that is. On top of that, he broke multiple world records. Several years ago in, in Kingston, he was interviewed and they asked him they said so what what is the secret of your success they asked this world famous runner to which he replied there are better starters than me but i'm a strong finisher 
And, and I suppose, of course, that's what he means in terms of the context of sprinting competitions. You can start slow as long as you finish in such a way. But it, but it got me kind of thinking as I, as I read that quote that um, the truth is that we are, we are not always good finishers, are we? Thanksgiving morning was beautiful, by the way. It was so beautiful that I, I lifted the garage door, and I, as the parades ended, I, I don't watch parades. I'd rather lay in a pile of fire ants and watch the parade. Um, uh, but the family likes it. If you like it, no problem. I just never understood why walk in a straight line playing instruments. Never figured it out. Don't take it personally. But once the parade was over, I kicked open the laptop and turned some football on where people were killing each other for a small ball, much more entertaining. And um, I uh, began, um, uh, began to try to bring organization to our garage again. And I say again because I have not ever finished that project. I have a half-finished landscaping project in the front of my house. Now, you guys knowing how handy I am anyway, right? Yeah, so uh, it, it's, it's half. Now, don't you judge me. Don't you be too harsh. Some of you have fast half-finished projects. You, you've got half clean closets, right? You've got half-read books, half-written books, half-bathed children. Yes, I've noticed when you're walking in, okay? So, so, so don't, don't look down on me. Oh, it's just part of fun. It's just part of life, right? The unfinished. They're leaving things unfinished in the professional world or the academic world. Well, that's the one more consequential, isn't it? In our work, we have to finish. So in our academics, we have to finish, having spent a few years as a high school teacher and several adjunct Bible college contracts, I, I learned that the people who did not do well in my class had nothing to do with their intellectual abilities. It was simply they never finished what was assigned to them. But more consequential is when we leave spiritual things unfinished. More consequential is we understand that God has a calling on your life to serve him in different capacities, and we don't fulfill that. And that's consequential. No, I'm not creating scarecrow arguments here because if you, if, you look at, if you look at the overall testimony of the scripture, and particularly the New Testament, you see that word show up a lot, finish. That God has called you to do certain things and we need to finish it and we certainly know that is a concern of the Apostle Paul. And so as we come to the end of Colossians, it is so interesting to me that as we look at the end, we see Paul's kind of final greetings and who he's going to speak to. And I fully admit that back in July and August when I was kind of piecing together this series, I really got excited about this passage. So much so that I skipped the passage that I used last week till Jeremy called me and said I needed to preach it. And I said, yes, sir. So I did it. And I kicked everything forward because I was going to talk about God's second string and all these amazing people. But Colossians 4.17 kept jumping off the page to me. Why? Why in the middle of all these final notes does a holy scripture go out of the way? Why did God choose in such a way to make sure that we hear Paul's instruction to a particular person to where he says, hey, fulfill the ministry that you have received from the Lord? I mean, we've gone through Colossians and we've seen these wonderful truths We've seen the nature of Jesus Christ. We've seen warnings against false doctrines. We would see truths about our salvation. And here at the end of this rich epistle, we find nestled in here this, this deal, archipus, archipus, archipus. Finish. Finish it. And I got to thinking about us. I got to think about where you're at in your life. I got to think about where we are collectively as a church and maybe there's some encouragement here for us. Now, was, was Paul encouraging Archippus? I don't know. Was he, was he scolding Archippus? I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. What we do know is this. He's going out of his way to say, look, you, you, you need to fulfill your ministry. And that's what I want to spend some time talking with you about because one of the great joys for me as a pastor is to look out over you and wonder, what's God going to do with you? And what's God going to do with you? And what's God going? I mean, that gives me such great joy to watch people come up and fulfill the things that the Lord has for them. 
So let's talk about this passage a little bit. And I think the best way for us to do it is we're just going to rip this sentence apart a few words at a time because in these words is some depth and in these words is some, so, so, some nurturing ingredients that I really want to show you. And I hope that you'll either get as excited as I am about it or you'll smile and nod and patronize me just a little bit, okay? All right? Because this is good stuff. So we're going to throw this sentence up here, but we're just going to underline each of the different parts of it when we get to it. But let's ask the first question. Who, who is Archippus? I, I know that sounds like a strange pronunciation, but Archippus is actually how it's pronounced, and I actually forgot that when I first read it. Archippus is how it's pronounced. Who was he? We actually don't know a lot. His name shows up twice in the scripture. It shows up here in Colossians, and it shows up over in Philemon, where, where Paul calls him a fellow soldier. We know he's a member of the church at Colossae, but there really is, is all that we know about him beyond that. Was he a pastor? Perhaps. Was he a layman? Perhaps. Different people have put together different history about who it might have been, but it's, but it's not really so important. It's more what the Apostle Paul said to this gentleman, Archippus. Fulfill, pay attention, see to it that you fulfill the ministry that the Lord has given to you. Let's look at the first part of the scripture, and I want to show you something. Say to Archippus, see that. Let me stop there. I love what the King James does with this translation, right? In the King James, it's, it's a little bit different here, and I love the wording. In the King James, it says, say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Now, the ESV didn't drop the ball in this translation because take heed or see to it. They're both coming from the same Greek word, but I love that power, that take heed. And what, what, is, what is the Apostle Paul really saying? What's the, what's the depth of this Greek word? It means pay attention. It means, it, means, it means turn and face something. Take heed to the microphone, right? Take heed, see that, right? It means to turn your face towards something. It means to pay attention to something. In other words, it means to be intentional about your ministry. In other words, Archippus, don't stumble into the ministry that God has called you to. Archippus, be intentional about the ministry that God has called you to. What does he have you doing? See to it, take heed to it. So if we were to drop this in contemporary language, we, we would say something like, Archippus, pay attention. Be sensitive to what God is doing and wants to do in the ministry he has given you. And I would say the reason we have to study this passage is because, because it goes to you. You can fill in your own name there this morning. Do you mind, Nick? Take heed. Pay attention to what God's calling you to do. Evie, take heed. Be intentional. Focus on what you think God is calling you to do. Put your own name there this morning. We're intentional about so many things. We were intentional about eating Thursday. <laughs> we're intentional about finding our Christmas presents. We're intentional about getting decorated. We're not so intentional about cleaning the garage or finishing the landscaping. But the Bible never tells us to be intentional about that. It says pay attention, be intentional, take heed to the ministry that what? That God has called you to in, in whatever that is. And, but, but look at the next word. See that next you fulfill. Next slide. No, thank you. You fulfill. See, see in, in the Greek, actually, it says you fulfill. It's actually ongoing. So, so it means to continue fulfilling, to stay faithful to, to keep doing it. it it's about finishing. Archippus, see to it. Take heed. Pay attention. Be intentional that you finish, that you fulfill. That is this ongoing thing about the ministry that God has called you to. Now, now would be a good time for us to, to pause and consider a couple of things. In hindsight, I should have put these up on the screen. I apologize for that, so maybe you can follow along with on an audio level here. Let's take a moment. What, what are the obstacles that keep us from fulfilling our ministry? Because I think so often we don't, we don't call the obstacles obstacles. But if we understand it's an obstacle, then we know how to deal with it. 
so we can fulfill the ministry that God has called us to do for whatever that looks like in your life this morning. I, I don't know what that is. Hopefully you do, and if you don't, then the Holy Spirit can help you with that. But there are obstacles that keep us from fulfilling our ministry, and, and, and one of those, to be quite frank, is slothfulness, being lazy. That's, where, that's, that's one of the greatest obstacles of people fulfilling their ministry. What is slothfulness? It is a temptation to do nothing. <laughs> oh, my crazy grandma, she used to say, I know she didn't come up with it, but, but she used to say, Gregory, don't call me that. Idle time is the devil's playground. You've heard that one, right? Well, maybe it makes sense. I mean, think about it. The enemy just needs to, to suck you into some kind of life or in, of immorality, right? All, all the enemy has to do is, is get you to do nothing. If the enemy can keep you from praying, if the enemy can keep you from giving, if the enemy can keep you from fellowship, if the enemy can keep you from witnessing, if the enemy can keep you from teaching and encouraging and being useful to the church and the kingdom of God, then the enemy wins. And so often our obstacles to ministry are simply because, frankly, we're spiritually lazy. We just want to do what's easy to us. Sometimes the obstacle to ministry is selfishness. I know that's a jagged edge to swallow. But can I be candid? I have met, I mean, I've been in a professional ministry since I was 20 years old. I am stunned at the number of selfish people I've met in the life of churches. I can remember one church I worked for, there was a woman in the choir and she'd get about halfway through the pastor's sermon every single week, crawl over everybody to walk out and slam the side door. Now, for you guys who have not been like in a normal church, Providence isn't normal, okay? The choir typically sits like up front. What's fun though is to watch YouTube videos of churches like that, but forget the pastor, look for the sleeping choir members, it's awesome. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. So, yeah, that's what I do when I'm being slothful, right? We, I knew another woman in another church that we, I served that would only come to church if she could play the flute. I served in another church where there was a gentleman who would sit in his car and read fiction until it was time for the choir to sing. Then he ran in, sang with the choir. Once he was done, he called everybody, went back out to his car and Red fiction. There's something in us, in our sinful nature, that just wants to pursue our own agenda and stay in our own comfort zones. But that's an obstacle to serving the Lord. Because see, Jesus Christ did the most selfless thing that has ever been done in the course of human history that he gave his life on a cross and shed his blood that, that we might live, right? So what happens is when I become a Christian, I, I die to self. Self is left behind. You know what another obstacle to ministry can be? Don't you throw anything at me. Safety team, get ready. Sometimes our spouse is an obstacle to ministry. Because sometimes spouses don't give each other the emotional freedom to serve the Lord. Years ago, I worked for a church, and one of my youth leaders was this woman. I inherited her when I took the job, who was a brilliant trumpet player. I love brass and service, and you just don't see it very often. And we'd lead worship for the students, and I'd play piano, and she'd play trumpet, and she was just so spirit filled. She could just fill in all the spots. It was amazing but her husband was a jealous, narcissistic, possessive individual who saw anything from the church as a threat to him. And as such, she rarely got to serve in those spaces. Husbands, do you, do you understand that, that you need to free your spouse to fulfill God's call in your life? To serve whatever that means? 
And that, that changes depending on, on your circumstances and your season in life. Right now, my wife is not in the service. She's not in the service because she's helping over in children's church. I want her to be able to use her gifts. Of course, she would rather be in here looking at her trophy hunk of a husband. Of course she would, right? I mean, I, I appreciate her sacrifice though, right? Husbands, you, 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 wives, you, 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 have to, you have to free You've got, you've, got, you've got to emotionally free your, your husband to serve the Lord. You can't be so possessive and jealous of every moment that they're serving God, saying somehow I have to have it all the time. You've got to free each other to serve God appropriately at appropriate amount of time and appropriate spaces in the church. And I do say appropriate. Young people who are not married yet, you better think about this before you get married. Girls, Listen to me, if, you, if, if you're wanting to marry a guy who thinks serving God is sitting in his boxers playing Xbox, bad idea. Guys, if you want to marry a girl who's going to call you 17 times a day and say, if you don't come home right now, I'm going to kill myself, okay? That's not a good ministry. So at some point we have to recognize that that, that serving God means in our relationships that we're freeing each other to serve God. Sometimes that's done in partnership. Kenny and Michelle, our children's director and her husband, they, they serve very much in partnership. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah, you can clap, that's fine. It's, it's a beautiful thing. They, they somehow figure it out. Sometimes our giftings are very, very different and there's nothing wrong with that either. You gotta figure that out. See what God wants you to do. Sometimes our obstacles are success. Sometimes we're so committed to being successful in the world that we leave the godly things behind, but you cannot sacrifice the eternal on the altar of the temporary. At some point, we have to say what matters and what is long-term and, and what is eternal and sometimes success in the world, and sometimes God gives us that to be able to share, which is amazing and wonderful. Praise God for that but you have to keep it in light that it doesn't keep us from serving God. Sometimes, sometimes preparation is a barrier. Sometimes we've, we've not prepared well to serve the Lord. And you might be saying, how do I prepare to serve the Lord? I don't know what God wants me to do. I've got an easy answer for that. Every time you come to church, you're preparing. Every time you open your Bible, you're preparing. Every time you join a small group, you're preparing. Every, every time you accept a ministry, even if you're not great at it, you're, you're preparing. Because the root and the foundation of all serving God is gonna be found in the word of God. So if you're not learning the word of God, you're not preparing to serve him. Are you following me? You can't say, oh, today I'm gonna serve to God. Now I'll read my Bible. No, it starts there. I always hesitate to, to mention you know, individuals in the church because I, I recognize that there, there are so many people in the life, even of our small body, that's doing awesome things. But I want to point out one example of somebody, and I, and I already sought his permission on doing this, about preparation. I, I feel like Josh Mallman, who's part of our church, who is regional director of FCA, is somebody who, who, who we've seen live this out came to our church several years ago when we were over at the Shrine Club and just kind of moved to Florida and had some church background then, but came here and he and I would meet at the Greek restaurant and talk and there's always a sense that God's got something for me. God has something for me. But he didn't just sit there and wait for it. He led groups and prayed with people and participated in the community and did all these kind of things. And every step, God was laying the groundwork for an amazing ministry he's doing right now. Isn't that cool? And so whatever it is you're doing right now, God, God can use that for whatever he has next for you. Quite frankly, sin is an obstacle. Can I just be candid? If you on this side are saying, God, I want to fulfill the ministry you have for me, but on this side, you say, I'm going to continue to live in unrepentant sin, and I don't care what the Word of God says. Hear me, those two things don't work. They don't work. Let me tell you how crazy our world is right now. 
social media posts. You can't make this stuff up. From a pastor who said that he had a person in his church that was leading a very unbiblical and very visibly unbiblical lifestyle. But somehow this person managed to get nominated for church leadership anyway. And when that person was approached with this nomination said that if they are selected to church leadership, then they will stop doing what they were doing for that time. And they still put them in church leadership. But see, that's an op sin. <laughs> it's an obstacle to fulfilling your ministry. Well, this continuous time gets away from us. So I say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the what? The, 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 the ministry. The, the service is another word that we could use here, that you fulfill what God has for you. We see this all throughout the scripture. Remember Exodus, you shall serve the Lord your God. Remember Deuteronomy chapter 10. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord, to walk in his ways, to love him, and to what? To serve the Lord your God. What does Hebrews say? Hebrews chapter 12, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. We look at spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians chapter 4. The gifts are always laid out in the sense that they are to serve and edify the local church. It is an imperative command. In other words, hear me, church. If you are a believer here this morning, if you would say, yes, pastor, I am a born-again Christian and I love Jesus, serving God is not optional because God has gifted you to serve. Now, you may be in a season right now where, man, I'm trying to figure things out. That's cool. I get that. Listen, sometimes people come to church and they're broken, they hurt, and they're like, okay, can I just have like a time out for a while? Listen, I hear you. That's completely legitimate. Thank you for that self-spiritual awareness. But at some point, you gotta say, okay, Lord, what do you have for me? And there's two contexts to that. One of those is outside the church, how God uses you. Because you do know that God uses attorneys. And God uses physicians. And God uses teachers. And, and God uses retailers. And God uses all kinds of people. You do know that, right? That God can put you in conversations all the time. But also God uses you in the life of the church. The life of Providence Church, if you're part of this church or whatever church that you've come from. And those gifts are different. They may not be seen every week. But, but somewhere, we in the church have been sold a bill of goods that is false. Because somewhere, somehow, we've come to believe that there's an hierarchy of holiness and the people serving are, is a guy talking on stage and, and the person working at the nursery and the children and the musicians and somehow it goes down from there. Can I say something to you? What I do up here is no more important than anything you're doing to serve the Lord this morning. Zero. I have a particular calling and a particular gift set that shows up every once in a while. <laughs> to do what I do. But if those people in the back decide to turn off my microphone, what I do is not very important anymore. Don't think about it, Jacob. <laughs> if the people hiding in this little secret room, which you need a passport to get into, don't do what they do, there's no screen. If those volunteer children's workers don't do what they do, you're holding your screaming four-year-old right now. All of us who serve God are important. Do you understand that? I understand the tradition of wearing robes and standing up in high pulpits, but I'll never do that. Because I don't think elevation is what God has called us to. That we are working together to serve the Lord. And all of us have a ministry here. But the last part, because this part, man, this part, just blow your mind. Ready? Ready? Here we go. If your neighbor's asleep, wake him up real fast because I don't want you to miss this. Everything else was just kind of like the soup to get ready for this. That you have received in the what? The Lord. Watch this. The gifts you have 
in the way you're serving God right now has been given to you by what? The Lord. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator of the universe, the master of all things, Christ first, the one who is preeminent, the one who is supreme, the one who was and is and will be to come, right? The one who knew you and formed you in your mother's womb, the one who knew you before the foundations of the earth. Hear me, church, that Lord gave you the ministry that you're called to. Do you feel the weight of that? I didn't give it to you. Jeff didn't give it to you. Your spouse didn't give it to you. Who did? God gave it to you. Would you just feel the weight of that for a minute? That when Mike comes up here and plays the guitar, and I remember when Mike was young, and he'd sit on mission trips, and he'd try to work on the piano and play his guitar, and we were like, will he ever stop? (laughs) I'm glad he didn't. Then when Jeremy was being drugged around the country by his family to sing all over the country, and he was setting up sound and getting yelled at by his dad, yeah, Rick, I see you back there, okay? (laughs) Those gifts were given to them by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you have to steward those gifts. Your gift might not be up here, but what's God burned your heart for? And God of the universe gave it, ordained it, For who? You. If if that that doesn't make you shake your, I got nothing for you. So why does it matter? What's the big deal? Let's finish up then. I have no idea where I'm at. I think I'm there. Why does it matter? Number one, (laughs) take heed pay attention, see that you fulfill your ministry is a matter of obedience. All good things begin with obedience. I said it before, I won't detail it. If you're a Christian here this morning, God's called you to serve him and what that looks like in your life. Number two, it matters because this is about your personal joy. Because when you are in that place that God wants you Joy comes. Oh, not happiness. Happiness is ex- external, right? It kind of goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And joy is fundamental. And so when we're in the place that God wants us to be serving him, and for some of you, that's God's got me home with my children right now and educating them. Praise God. God's got me in this job where I talk to unbelievers all day. Praise God. God's got me helping in sound at church. I don't know what it is for you, but when you're in that place that God wants you, there's joy. The third reason why it matters, and this is just really selfish. I mean, this is like so, maybe the most selfish thing I've ever said from the pulpit, but I, but I just want to be real with you. This matters because for the staff, for me and, and Jeff and, and Michelle and Vanessa and for the elders or Jeremy, Mike and Tony and Scott, we want to see you be amazing for the Lord. We, we, want, we want to see you do great things for God. And we don't always end a Sunday morning have a chance to tell you because we're all busy and we're all running around. But we sit down for session meetings where the, the elders get together and we talk. And I always start every elders meeting the same way. Tell me something great that's happened in the life of the church since I last saw you. And it's never about them. It is always about you guys. Always. We want to see you be amazing for God. <laughs> We want to see you fulfill your ministry because for the leadership, that brings us tremendous joy. And finally, it matters because finishing matters. Jesus thought so. Matthew 25, remember the parable? Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy 
of your master. Isn't that what you want to hear? And we don't serve to hear that. We serve because we will hear that. (laughs) We don't serve to get saved. We serve because we are saved. We take our lives and we say, God, here I am, use me. Until the sweet day that he says to you, well done, well done. Can we pray? Father in heaven, already there's so many amazing men and women and young people who are serving you so well. A missionary who has just returned. Lord, thank you for Gail and Bob and what they do throughout the whole world. For our staff who serves you faithfully and daily for way less than they're worth. For the amazing volunteers, many of whom aren't even in the room right now because they're, they're serving you. So Lord, encourage them. Help them to continue to take heed to the ministry by which you have given them. But God, for the man or woman or young person this morning that there's, there's a burning in their bones right now. <laughs> it's like, God, I want you to use me. Lord, open doors. Give them a sense of your will. Use them, Lord. And God, as a church, Lord, may Providence Church take heed to the ministry you've given us that we will fulfill it because it's yours. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Do you guys stand and worship with us?
Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Oh worship His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul oh, Worship His holy name oh, 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 Lord, I worship your 